Greetings! This is Build Series Sydney. I am your host, Danny Clayton. And coming in, we have someone that revolutionised the film industry all around the world. He's an executive producer, director and writer of your next favourite thriller called The Invisible Man. Let's take a look at the trailer. As the attorney representing Adrian's trust, I'm required to read a prepared statement. Cecilia... Although our relationship was far from perfect, I thought that you would talk to me rather than run away. Are you okay? I would not die! What happened to him? He cut his wrists. Per his final wishes, you're getting five million dollars. Contingent, of course, on the fine print. He can't be ruled to be mentally incompetent. It just doesn't make any sense. What? Adrian wouldn't kill himself. Listen, you're getting your freedom back, okay? Don't let him haunt you. Hello? I'm scared. You don't have to be scared of him anymore. He was a sociopath, completely in control of everything. He said that wherever I went, he would find me, walk right up to me, and I wouldn't be able to see him. Are you okay? Someone sitting in that chair. I found something that can prove what I'm experiencing. You need help. Adrian is dead. I went to his house today. He's not dead. I have a pile of ashes in a box that would disagree with you. He has figured out a way to be invisible. Only thing more brilliant than inventing something that makes you invisible is coming up with the perfect way to torture you, even in death. Adrian's true genius was how he got in people's heads. Don't come any closer. Hey! I'm not crazy. Please listen to me. You're saying the person trying to kill you is in the room right now, but we can't see him? He's listening. Where are you? Where are you? Show yourself! Come on! Do it! There you are. Please welcome Lee Winnell. How are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm good. Obviously a bucket of laughs there. Yeah. Uh, good times to be had by all. Lots of hijinks. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is just around the corner. We are about to have this movie release uh, in cinemas all across the country. Where will you be when that drops? When the film comes out? Um, it's interesting. I used to do this thing where I had this tradition of like, driving around, like rent some crappy limo and drive around <laughs> to different theatres in LA if I was in LA and you go and, you know, you see who's in the theatre, how many people are there. But that kind of died off after a while. Um, it's kind of mortifying to I, – I don't know why that was fun for the first few years. Like um, I think it ended when I, I, I was – uh, I was involved in a film and I went opening night to check out different theatres and there just wasn't many people in each theatre and the mood was just, it went from like, you know, everybody uh, on this high to like this funeral, like yeah. sombre mood. Well, you set the vibe, like I mean, the, the standard pretty high. Uh, once the popularity of something like Saw uh, occurred, I mean, anything after that would probably be quite challenging to go from cinema to cinema. Yeah, it is hard to come out of the gates with something. It's like a band whose first album is a massive hit. It's yeah. always like, ugh, now yeah. we have to follow that up. <laughs> sure. You know, it's easier to build up to something than just come out of the gates. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Saw was kind of a weird phenomenon. It was um, uh, surreal to experience it. Mm. Um, and uh, a, lo a lot of the experiences from that film I don't think I'll ever top. Mm. You know, that was it. That's as good as it's going to get. Sure. Um, I remember being at the Toronto Film Festival with James Wan who directed the film and we we had to wait 10 months for the film to come out. We finished the movie in like December of 2003. We went to Sundance, it went pretty good and then we had to wait 10 months for the film to come out and we were just twiddling our thumbs. I, I went back to Melbourne, I'm still living in a share house with the same guys <laughs> I was living with before the saw happened and I'm just kicking around, I'm you know, like, 
checking the internet religiously, looking for any morsel of information about the release of the film. And then finally, mercifully, September rolls around. They fly us over to the Toronto Film Festival. We had this big sort of premiere there, a midnight screening of the film. So we roll up to the theatre. I guess it's 11.30 at night and there's this line of people around the block to get into the theatre. And we, It was like, I kind of just got chills then. Uh, and we were like, I said to the publicist, oh, my God, look at all those people waiting to get into the film. And she said, those aren't the people waiting to get into the film. Everyone's already in the theatre. Those are the people waiting to see if there's spare tickets. You're kidding. This long line around the block. And I was just like, whoa, it yeah. was crazy. So, like, how's it ever going to get better than that? Mm. You know, just close the lid on that one. Yeah, and you were quite um, young as well at, at this stage. Yeah, I think I was 27 when that happened. Mm. And, you know, I wrote the first draft of Saw when I was 23 or 24 years old. So it was... a mm. It was uh, very surreal and probably is never going to get better. Yeah. I mean, I've even uh, seen pop culture references to, <laughs> yeah, to Billy yeah. the, the, the puppet yeah. absolutely everywhere. Uh, in fact, I've even seen them hidden in uh, films, uh, I mean, in Insidious uh, that made a little cameo yeah, as well. always. And it's in this film. It's in The Invisible Man. That was the question that I wanted to ask you. I kept my eyes out and I did not see Billy. You missed it. You missed it. Are it you going to tell us it where it is? No, or? I can't tell you. I do it for every film, like my last film, Upgrade, it was in there, you know. With an eight written underneath it as well, I noticed. Yeah, there was something, people really took that as like a hidden code. But um, it's in there for this one, it's just kind of a tradition, it's like, I'm really superstitious because movies are so weird and, and when they get released, you don't have any control over their success, so you really buy into magical thinking, like the whole <laughs> lucky underpants theory, mm. you know. Uh, and I'm so superstitious that I feel like if I don't put that puppet in the movie, it's gonna, <laughs> you know, belly flop and yeah. just be a, a, a total waste of time. So, yeah, it's just kind of a fun tradition. Are you wearing lucky underwear right now, or just regular no jokes? Underwear. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Um, I mean, I've only just discovered big news just dropping about Spiral from the Book of Saw. Yeah, right. This is... I just saw the trailer for the first time today as well. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so moments before I, I watched it and I was you know, blown away. You've got people like Chris Rock, Samuel L. Jackson uh, in a, a Saw mm -hmm. film. Yeah. Uh, how does that make you feel when you when you see this? It's bizarre. It's I'm, I'm strangely detached from it whilst also thinking, wait, because I sat in a room when I was still living with my parents and wrote a movie, Chris Rock is now devoted six months of his life. It's That's a surreal feeling, like how films take on a life of their own. Mm. And uh, it's funny because uh, the first film I directed was Insidious Chapter 3. It was like the third Insidious film. And, um, you know, James Wan, who had directed the first two, went off to do like Fast and Furious Part 10. And uh, the producer, Jason, is like, it's your turn, buddy. <laughs> and uh, that was a great Jason impression. You guys don't know him. It didn't land, but I'm telling you it was flawless. And uh, and I was like, yeah, I'm too scared. And, you know, you, you don't go skydiving by doing it. Someone pushes you out of the plane. You mm. don't do it yourself. And uh, so I did it and I found out I loved directing. And then they put me on this list. You know, they have a lot of lists in LA. They love lists. Ten directors to watch, which is apparently a thing in variety every year. Mm. And so they put me on that list and... All of a sudden you get invited to a dinner at some fancy restaurant and I'm walking in and my agent's like, I'm going to introduce you to Chris Rock. Agents are like parents pushing two kids together. Like you both like trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, all of a sudden you're standing there mortified in front of like, you know, John Hamm being like, huh. and uh, so he pushes me at Chris Rock and I'm said something lame. Like I'm a big fan. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, thank you. Thank you very much. Walked away. And I'm just thinking, why? Why did you do that? And then as he's walking away, his agent says to him, you know, that guy wrote Saw. And he just stops, does a U-turn, <laughs> comes back, and now he's Chris Rock. Yeah. He was like, you wrote Saw? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I did. And he's like, I love Saw. And he's like, I want to write a Saw film one day. And I thought it was just one of those things you say in yeah. conversation. You know, if you're talking to a juggler, you're like, I've always wanted to juggle. You don't mean it. You, <laughs> you hate jugglers. You actively hate them, but you're mm -hmm. talking to a juggler. You're trying mm -hmm. to find a connection. Turns out he wasn't bullshitting. He yeah. really did want to write a Saw film. He, uh, he, that was surreal. I was like, wait, that thing was true. Um, so he had obviously been thinking about it for a while, and yeah. that's why he did the U-turn. How like, many years? How many? How many years later is this from that moment? 
So that happened. That was 2015. So it's a good five years. He's been. Yeah. He's really been sitting on this one. Yeah. And uh, I remember he said to me, he's like, he's like, don't you think Saul would have worked well as a comedy? Can't you see like me and Jonah Hill tied up in a room? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, yeah, I can't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All. I was like, yeah, that would have been a good version, but mm. um, really surreal. I mean, I'm a big uh, Chris Rock fan, so it's weird. Mm. Uh, but um, I just watch it from outside the fishbowl now because mm. I don't really have anything to do with those films anymore. Sure. And I mean, it was very interesting to find out that he was so heavily involved in, in writing, uh, you know, the story for that particular yeah, movie. He um, really did. So when it comes to that writing scheme, uh, particularly with this film, uh, The Invisible Man, how did that come about for you? I mean, generally, sometimes people come up and say, hey, look, this, this is an opportunity to write on this film. Mm -hmm. and We really want you. Uh, when was that moment for you? It was uh, a meeting that I had. I just finished Upgrade and I was really happy with it and, um, you know, ready to take a rest. You know, at the end of every film, you feel like you're about to collapse. And I went for a meeting and I was certain that I was taking this meeting because they were going to tell me how great my film was and how great I was. And they just started talking about The Invisible Man and I was mystified. <laughs> like, why are we talking about The Invisible Man again? And um, one of the guys in the meeting said, you know, what would you do with that character? What would be your take on it? And purely to fill up dead air, I was just like, I would probably tell the story from the point of view of his victim. And uh, they were like, interesting. <laughs> you know, they, all of a sudden I had a job and, uh, and now I'm talking to you about it. Yeah, so fantastic. I guess it's a testament to being open to all ideas. Good ideas can come from anywhere mm. for a film. Um, and yeah, this one was something that was suggested to me and I just, the more I thought about it, the more I could see an opportunity to, um, modernize this character and mm. tell this story in a really modern way, kind of grounded and, uh, make it really tense, you know? Yeah. I mean, because originally this is an uh, H.G. Wells story from the mm. from quite some time ago. Uh, yeah. So, were you familiar with his work and the, his version of the Invisible Man? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, the Invisible Man is one of those classic monster characters, um, alongside Dracula and mm. Frankenstein and the Wolfman. One of these characters that's endured over a long time and become so much part of popular culture that it's almost comedic now. Yeah. You know, nobody these days is finding Frankenstein really scary anymore. <laughs> I'm sure people in the 30s were like, yeah! Mm. <laughs> but now when you think of Frankenstein, you think of the monsters, you know, yeah. someone with the bolts in their neck. Um, if you go back to the original source material, you mm. know, he he's not lumbering around with bolts in his neck. He's like this hideous figure. So it's kind of getting back to that central horrific thing. And And I felt like, for this story to be scary again and not be hokey, it had to be really modernised. I had to pretend that no Invisible Man movie had ever been made before mm. and that this was the first one, you know, um, and that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. You didn't consider Kevin Bacon, uh, bringing Kevin Bacon into No, I don't the... think that would have been a good move. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I li he lives in my neighbourhood. I could have asked him. <laughs> um, no, I, I wanted to be blissfully ignorant of all other iterations of The Invisible Man. Like sure. I, I didn't want to go back to watching any other film that had featured that character or even a film that had featured invisibility. Like even the Harry Potter films have this <laughs> element of invisibility about them. Um, with the you know the the disappearing cloak or whatever it's called, and now cloak of invisibility. Yeah, Excuse I, I, know, I, me. Just, I just heard a lot of Potter fans just get real yeah. mad. It's one of the Deathly there. Hallows, man. God, yeah, exactly. you can't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, it's, yeah, that's like your grandfather or something being like, I love that Star Wars and those light swords. Yeah. Can you, you like, teach me how to Twitter? Um, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I just. I wanted. Uh, a fresh take. A fresh take and something that felt like – I wanted the audience to watch it and think this could really happen, which is hard to do when you're talking about something as outlandish as invisibility. Mm. But technology is evolving at such a you know, rapid clip. I think a lot of things that were sci-fi concepts even 10, 15 years ago are now ubiquitous. Like, you know, my, my daughter thinks it's perfectly normal to – walk into the kitchen and be like, Alexa, play <laughs> Billie Eilish. And like <laughs> this weirdo voice is like playing Billie Eilish mm. and watching you at all times. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so I felt like I could bridge a gap 
to some sort of reality where mm. people would accept it at face value that someone could really do this. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, I watched the film uh, with some producers who I made promise uh, that they would <laughs> never tell anyone that I yelped with fear during the yeah, watching. Great, the, great. So naturally, everyone in this room knows yeah, that, that was I screamed. Much the first thing uh, that was said when I walked yeah, in the door. Yeah. yeah, I think there was a, actually a, a group email, like a office wide <laughs> yeah, email yeah. that went around. Um, there are moments where you know quite terrifying. It, it is a thriller, but there are definitely some you know tastes of of, of horror, um, and I noticed that in some thrillers is the tension gets lifted just a tiny bit just to take a breath and then you're usually sunk back into it but with this film you are kind of left in a state of of ominous kind of unease is this an, in, an intended kind of feeling for the audience yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wanted to i wanted to make a film that was tense from the first frame mm. uh, a lot of movies will build to that tension you know they'll spend a bit of time getting to know the characters, you know, everything's fine and then suddenly the guillotine falls and things have gone wrong. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to start with the guillotine. Mm. And so I wanted to see if I could make a film that was like someone's boot on your throat for two hours and you just can't <laughs> breathe, <laughs> suffocating. A really stressful experience, a fun time at the movies is what mm. I'm saying. Yeah, and um, that visceral reaction as well, like a, a, the audible yell is that the kind of the pinnacle of what you're aiming for for a director or is it awards or kind deep of. thought or it is i mean it's i guess it's the horror equivalent of people falling out of their chairs laughing in a comedy you know mm. um you know that that they have a saying in comedy like if you do well you killed them it's always to do with murder it's like mm. you know i killed them tonight i murdered them <laughs> and uh it's almost like an ant antagonistic relationship with the audience that stand up comedians have and the same goes for horror i think it's like you want to murder them. <laughs> you want them to be in physical pain. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, well, let's talk about the actors. Uh, and I'd like just to, to take a, a step away uh, from the protagonist of the film, of course, an Emmy a winner, but look more at the supporting roles mm -hmm. because I think that one of the strengths of this film is that every single support role shines. There's no characters in the film that feel unnecessary or arbitrary. This is a film made up of, of really strong characters. Now, uh, looking at someone like Harriet Dyer, um, mm -hmm. you, you really kind of feel with her and go on that journey with her. How do you give those characters space to kind of shine in a supporting role? Um, you kind of have to care that much about each character. You know, you you I like to base char uh, characters in my screenplays on people I know. So I feel like I have this relationship with them and I feel like I can predict what they would do in certain situations. Harriet's, <coughs> excuse me, Harriet's character is based on a friend of mine. Okay. And so I haven't really told her that. I don't know. I, I, I don't want people to be like, this is who you think I am. Mm. So, but I definitely based it on her and um, I felt like I had a good knowledge. And then And then comes the conversation. So when you hire the actors and suddenly you're in, in a room with them, you start talking to them and you want them to contribute, especially with supporting characters. You know, you, you want them to flesh out little details. So I like to give people ownership, um, like with Storm Reid, who played the, uh, the daughter in the, the young film. girl. Yes. Yeah. I, she was like this aspiring fashion student and I give people homework. Like I wanted her to go and buy a jacket from an op shop and like, make stitch it up and change it and like i gave her a project and like i've made actors do diaries before in the voice of their character um i will um i'll make actors if they have a relationship like a father-daughter relationship i'll assign them to go on dates and like have have spent time together <laughs> and um it's just that that homework aspect of it helps fill in those blanks and so by the time you're shooting if you've done your job, the actor feels like they have a real hold on who this person is mm. and they do a lot of the work for you. They make you look good. Yeah. You know, actors who are as good as Harriet and, and Aldous Hodge and Storm Reid, they, they bring the writing to life. You know, if a supporting character is kind of not as, not as filled in as that main character, they'll be the ones to get it over the line and they'll be the ones to make it interesting. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's fun. It's one of the fun parts of directing is torturing actors and, yeah. <laughs> and getting them to um, give them, giving them homework, basically. Yeah, I mean, would you describe yourself as an actor's director? I hope so. I mean, I've been an actor myself, so I do feel like I know what an actor wants to hear. And I've heard a lot of stories about directors who can't work 
work well with actors and they're more mm. technical. I'm definitely the former. Like I like to get in there and and um, give the actors room to play but also, you know, keep it to ourselves. I don't want the entire crew listening in on our conversations. And so I, I just have fun doing that stuff. I have fun um, getting an actor to a certain place and um, especially in the types of films I've directed, there's usually someone who's very distressed. And so getting them to that place is kind of fun. You can tell that they enjoy being able to do that. Like they have this feeling of achievement when they really mm. go there. Um, and so uh, I, I would call myself an actor's director, yeah. Well, I mean, let's talk about C uh, for a moment. Celia, yeah. the mm -hmm. protagonist. I mean, you were talking about when they get quite distressed and mm – -hmm. I mean, as as a viewer, you watch this person slowly descend into to madness, and it her, the her un, she's uncomfortable, she's distressed, and and it makes you feel uneasy, and she's just trying to keep it together. And this, of course, was delivered in, incredibly by an, an Emmy award winning actress, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Moss. Uh, so when you're taking someone to a place that is uncomfortable, how? Mm -hmm. How do you make that still prof like professional and keep things right. comfortable but right. also push them over the edge <laughs> so that they give that performance? It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. You, each actor is different. That's one thing I've learned is actors have different approaches. Some people, they don't want you to talk to them or some people want to talk about everything. Some actors want to go over everything relentlessly. You've kind of got to tune into an actor's wavelength and figure out what they like and don't like. Hmm. And they're all so different. And oftentimes in the one cast, you're dealing with several actors in the same scene, each of whom deals with acting in a very different way. So you've got to go hmm. over here and do it this way. And then, you know, with Elizabeth, she doesn't want to overanalyze it. She has this amazing facility to just turn it on and off. Like she would be screaming in the middle of a scene, just, ah, you know, mascara running down her cheeks, crying. And I'd be like, cut. And she's like, Instagram. <laughs> and then you're like, she's like, it's like, and action. <laughs> like it's just back on. You know, some actors need to pace around and clear the set. And it's almost like calling attention to themselves. Like, you know, be quiet and pace and, and, and really get in the zone. Lizzie's not like that. It's like a button that she pushes. She's just mm. like on, distressed, off. And, um, and I, you know, she's got it so dialed in. She's been acting since she was a teenager, since she was very young. And I think she's just honed it down to a samurai sword. Mm. Um, and uh, it's great. You know, other actors, I remember my first film on Insidious 3, the, the lead actor was quite a young girl. She was like 17 years old and she was so chirpy and pleasant and I needed her to be in this distressed place. So I locked her in a room on the soundstage that was pitch black and made her listen to like Norwegian death metal for two hours. <laughs> she had, And I would, I would said, I'm going to do random spot checks on you. Uh. And like I would burst into the room hoping to catch her listening to Katy Perry or something yeah, yeah. and be like, aha, but no, she was still sitting there. She would pull the headphones off and you'd just hear like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and she'd be like staring at me and I'd be like, good, good. Keep it there. Yeah. When I think about it, it was so stupid, but in my mind I was like, this is, I need to like get her out of her comfort zone because she mm -hmm. was just so like happy go lucky and like, hey everyone, how are everyone? And I was like, okay, you're not allowed to talk to anyone today. You're only allowed to talk to Satan. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, I had it up really loud. Sorry, I wouldn't let her turn the volume down. It was probably damaging to her ears. Um, I should be in court. Yeah. Uh, and, I love that you think that that is the epitome of, of hell is Norwegian death metal. I mean, some I people it. here I, probably quite enjoy it. I, no, I, I enjoy it, but I, I, it's evidenced to me frequently that other people do not. <laughs> mm. And so I just, it's not so much that I wanted, I wanted her to be hating it, like torturing the tor torturing her in that sense. I just wanted her to experience a different reality where like almost change her brainwaves into like this mm. weird state. So you try these different things, you know, either the actor wants to play with you or they don't. Mm. Some actors will be like, I've had this where you're like, I want you to sit in a closet and listen to death metal. No, I ain't doing that. <laughs> and you're like, okay, then don't. <laughs> mm. See, I would have gone down the baby shark route. Yeah, yeah, right. There's no yeah, quicker exactly. way to send someone into a spiral of insanity yeah. than baby shark. Now, uh, we do have a lot of questions coming okay. through. Um, Hugh says, do you have any advice for aspiring young actors? Are you open to actors reaching out to you and sending their stuff to you? Or do you find uh, that your <laughs> next muse, uh, sorry, that, you, that they come more organically? Well, 
That um, sounds like a very... It's an audition, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I would say, um, are these questions coming from people in the room? Is uh, the call coming from within the house? So, some watching, maybe some even in the okay. house. Yeah, well, yeah, you don't right. know, really. It's a um, surprise. This is actually your question, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, look, I'm, I, uh, I, I can act, man. I swear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I swear. Um, Acting's weird because it's kind of powerless. Like, it's the only art form where you need a panel of jurors to give you a thumbs up before you can practice it. I mean, I guess you could walk onto a street corner and just start spouting off some soliloquy from (laughs) Hamlet, but you'll probably get locked up pretty quickly. Uh, uh, um, You know, if you're a writer, you can grab a a notepad and a pen and start writing. If you're a painter, you can grab some paints and paint. You know, you can pick up a guitar if you're a musician. But if you're acting, you really need other people to give you permission to do it. That's the most frustrating part of it is auditioning and waiting for someone to give you the thumbs up. Um, I was part of that process when I was in my twenties, I was going to auditions and it wasn't working out. I'm the world's worst auditioner. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm terrible. And so I just kind of said to my friend James, who I'd gone to film school with, let's just make our own film. Like I'll act in it. And so that probably would be my advice is if, if you're feeling frustrated as an actor is to try and make your own work, either mm. write, your own stuff or team up with someone who's a writer and try to practice it without needing someone else's permission. Let them come to you. Okay. But you'll still take my reel after this interview, right? Absolutely. I, I mean, will. Hughes. Uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> anyway, oh, yeah. uh, uh, another Looking question. Looking forward to your scene from Sea Patrol. <laughs> I hear it was incredible. Um, being a writer, EP and director, what is your favourite craft from Anonymous? From Anonymous. Mm, okay, I spooky. love that Hackers Collective. From Jigsaw. Um, uh, I would say directing. You know, directing is the most fulfilling. You go home at the end of the day really feeling like you achieved something. Writing is many, many days you end the day feeling like you've achieved nothing and, if, and that if you didn't exist, the world would not <laughs> have noticed. It's just, it's kind of frustrating writing and you're banging your head against a wall a lot. Acting is fun in terms of playing dress-ups, like, hey, look at me, I'm a fireman. Uh, But it's there is something kind of powerless about it. I'd rather be directing the actor than taking the orders, you know, so I'd rather be the drill sergeant than the the rookie. So I I think I'd choose directing as my favourite. Okay. Um, so it's been 20 years uh, since the Saw films. Do you feel back then I that they were... I was 10 when I made that <laughs> film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you feel like back then that they would make such an impact on the industry and your career? Did I feel like it would make an impact before it came out? No. I was hoping it would come out on VHS. I was mm. hoping that we would... Our big goal was a straight to... That was the era of like straight to video. You know, mm. video stores were still breathing their last gasps back then and like there would be this... There was this whole industry of straight to video films uh, that would bypass theatres and just... And that was our big goal. Mm. James Wan and I were like, we're going to get there. We're going to get into Blockbuster. <laughs> and uh, we had no idea that it would be this wide release movie and have this impact. It kind of happened to us rather than happening because of us. You know, Mm. it wasn't by design. A lot of filmmakers, especially in LA, there's a real uh, surplus of confidence in Los Angeles, you may have heard. Really? You know, yeah. (laughs) A lot of people, a lot of uh, of directors walking around like, uh, I'm pretty good. I'm great, actually. I got a lot to say. (laughs) Uh, um, And uh, we were not that. We were like, you know, keeping our Australian self-deprecating nature about us and um, we didn't think that that would happen and it did yeah I th- or what did not having a budget when you were making those films initially like not just saw but i'm saying the other films that you worked on what do you think creating films without a budget taught you i mean it teaches you to to really uh be unique within the story because if you don't have any budget that means you don't have any actors unless you're best friends with ryan reynolds you're not going to have any actors of any note in your film. Are you best friends with Ryan Reynolds? Uh, I'm best friends with his cousin, Frank Reynolds. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> so I can get, I'm, I'm Ryan Reynolds adjacent. Okay. Um, I, 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 uh, I, you don't have any money. You don't have any money for effects or anything like that. You know, money is what buys you visual effects and tons of extras and battle scenes and big name actors Uh, Without any of that, you're forced to rely on the story and the power of the story, you know. And so 
I guess it hones that. It hones hones that spear of story down and and not feeling like you're coasting on visuals. Um, and to, we live in an era where there's so much content. You know, it wasn't the same. When Saw came out, it was still kind of like, you know, gaming. You know, there's Foxtel around. But now we're competing with YouTube and Netflix and just so many things. There's so much competition for people's attention these days. So now you really have to punch through the noise to be heard. Mm. So I think you really have to do something unique. And um, if you're working with no budget, that's all you've got. Yeah. And wildly, it, you can afford a very, very good camera. Like you can have a teenager pick up a $2,000 camera and make cinema-style movies these days, which but is... I'm, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, if, I had, if somebody asked me uh, about becoming a filmmaker, you know, the filmmaking version of that actor's question, I would say that, you know, when, when I was in film school, it was really hard to make films. It was so expensive to shoot on film. You know, film is insanely expensive, especially 35 mil. Mm. It's, you know, you just couldn't do it. I didn't have that kind of money. And so you had all these ideas, but you couldn't actually get them happening. Um, and video cameras were terrible. Video cameras, it was something you kept in your house in case you're, you know, your cousin got married, you'd be there with the camera, <laughs> but you, you, wouldn't gonna, you weren't going to shoot a film on it. Um, nowadays technology has democratized filmmaking. So any aspiring filmmaker who asks me for advice, I always say, just get out there and start shooting. You, you've got no excuse. I had all the excuses. <laughs> you know, I had all the excuses to be drunk on a Tuesday playing, you know, Grand Theft Auto because I couldn't make a film. Now you can shoot a film on this phone in your pocket. Mm. You know, it shoots beautiful HD images and you can edit it on your laptop there's just no excuse. So my advice would be to write that feature script and go and start shooting it, you mm. know, get a pe bunch of people together and do it. Wow. And then, and then the other problem was you, even if you managed to scrape together the money to make a film in my day, uh, you could, you, where would you show it? You know, you, you had to wait, maybe a festival would let you show it. Now you can upload it to the internet, you know, YouTube, have a Vimeo channel, there are places to show your stuff. So all these opportunities are laid out for aspiring filmmakers today that weren't around 10, 20 years ago. And so I would encourage everyone to take advantage of it. Wow. That was wildly inspirational. <laughs> really unexpected. Um, one last question from the Q&A, and that is, uh, given that your films can be quite intense, uh, were there any hilarious moments on set with the cast and crew of this current film? <laughs> oh, I don't want to. Okay, there was there, there was one moment where, um, without wanting to give anything away, we had the <laughs> the Invisible Man, who's really a guy in a full green bodysuit. <laughs> he was hiding in a cabinet, and we had this scene. It's in the trailer, so I guess I can talk about it. And it's a locked off shot. It's just a fr uh, a frozen shot of this kitchen, and Elizabeth Moss walks out of frame. And this knife that was sitting on the counter is supposed to disappear and get taken away by the invisible man. And we're shooting and it's all quiet. And this hand reaches up and he couldn't find the knife, <laughs> this green glove. And like, I have never seen, like blood was pouring down the lips of all every crew member because they were biting their tongue so hard. To tr everyone was like, <laughs> and like it was breaking and, I, and, I, and he couldn't find it. And finally he found the knife and pulled it away. And I was like, cut yeah. and the entire crew i mean it was the hugest chorus of laughter i've ever heard and i just had this moment of fear like oh we're dead because i think that was the first thing we did yeah but um yeah eventually we got him to find the knife and you see the finished film and uh it doesn't look like kermit the frog is drunk searching for his kitchen knife anymore <laughs> okay hopefully it actually looks scary Okay, so uh, basically that's going to make the extra features on the DVD, surely? Now that you say it, actually the Andy Canny, who is the editor of the film, has been saying to me, can we do a cut of this movie for the, for the disc with all the green man suit stuff? <laughs> just leave him in there. Mm. So Lizzie will just turn around with his fear in her eyes and there's just some stunt man in a green suit <laughs> standing there. <laughs> and she's like, and, uh, um, I'll think about it. I'll think about it, Andy.
Definitely a comedy. Um, okay, before I do let you go, uh, one of the things that I guess um, I watched as a, a young whippersnapper was something that was similar to my job now. And that was because you used to be a, a reporter for Recovery, <laughs> yeah. which is like, mind-blowing. This was a show which revolutionized the uh, television uh, in, in Australia. Yeah. Um, looking back at that, because I know that you've had a few uh, get-together with the old crew yeah, yeah. of Recovery. We had one the other night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, what was that like when, when you look at the the grand scheme of, of your career was that like a really huge stepping stone I think it was but I didn't know it at the time mm. you know I was <laughs> ungrateful teenager I was 19 when I started doing that show and I had no idea what I was doing I had no experience in television and uh Bruce Kane who was the producer and creator of the show uh his big idea was to take a bunch of people with no tv experience and indeed, uh, no right to be on television and <laughs> put them on television uh, and make it live. What could go wrong except for everything? <laughs> and um, and I, when I look back on it now, I realise it was huge in, 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 in uh, building confidence for me because all of a sudden I was interviewing these filmmakers that I was in awe of. You know, I interviewed Wes Craven, Peter Jackson, Tim Burton, John Woo, Jackie Chan, Samuel L. Jackson. And like I'd be sitting there kind of doing what you're doing and interviewing. But actually it's funny, the ABC recently made a documentary about recovery for the 20-year anniversary and um, the, the woman who was producing the documentary sent me this B-roll footage of me interviewing Wes Craven, who director of Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream and this horror icon who sadly passed away a few years ago. And so it's all the footage unedited. So it's got us setting up and setting up the lights and um, really disconcerting how Australian I sounded back then. I sounded like the crocodile hunter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and and uh, there's a moment where they stop to reposition the cameras and I'm like, so Wes, I really want to be a, a horror filmmaker. Can you tell me? And I'm oh, just no. hitting him up for information. And and he was kind of gracious. You know, he, I could tell he was like, oh, he's one of these guys. And so he was like, well, he's giving me advice. And. I was looking at that. I was like, wow, like uh, I, if only my 19 year old self could have seen my future, like mm. then, like, um, you know, if he had handed me some mysterious crystal ball and be like, check it out, my mind would have been blown. But back then I, I think I was so needy. I was so, I had this, such a desire to be doing what I'm doing now that I wasn't quite a, appreciating talking to Wes Craven, I was thinking, I don't want to interview Wes Craven. I want to be Wes Craven. But now that I look back at it, I think I should have appreciated it more while I was there and kind of lived in it, you know? So final question then, Lee, what would you have said to a 19 year old Lee? <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I probably would have said that, uh, enjoy it. Don't overthink everything. Don't, don't get stressed about the future. There's this thing that happens, you know, when you make a film, especially in LA, they want to know what's next. Their attention span is that of a goldfish. And like they celebrate for five seconds and then everybody's like, what's next? What's next? What's next? Agents, producers, managers, all the plankton of the film industry that attaches itself to like creative people is like, what do you got? What do you got? It's this insatiable coal fired, you know, oven that needs to be fed and I would let that stress me out. I would be like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I That's would a say, lot to tell a 19-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, at this stage, I was like 26 years old when Saw happened. So I, I would say to my 19-year-old self, I'd say, listen, you just, um, just enjoy it. Like, don't worry about all the pressure that people put on you. Like, just sit in it. You'll be fine. And yeah. Okay. I would give that advice to anyone else. Brilliant. Well, let me say that I enjoyed this. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. I seriously appreciate it. Yes, Thanks, check guys. out The Invisible Man in cinemas very soon. This has been Lee Winnell here on Build Series Sydney.